Good morning. We're in the middle of chapter 10. We are describing the differences between the tzaddik who is complete and the tzaddik who is not yet complete. And the reason we are describing the difference between the tzaddik who is complete and the tzaddik who is not complete is because by understanding, when we will understand how to truly accomplish the perfect service of Hashem, the perfect transformation of the animal soul and the, and the kalipa that sustains it, uh, that is how we will be able to understand the stopping and starting, the stopping and starting the hills and the valleys, the agony and the ecstasy, the ongoing struggle of the Bainani. Uh, and that's going to be the focus of the remainder of the Sefer, obviously, because that is, that's us. That's who the Alter Rebbe is primarily speaking to, is Bainanim, average servants of Hashem. Let's begin with a quote from the Gemara that will take us through really the rest of this chapter of Tanya. The Gemara is from Sukkah, and we should spend a little time understanding all of the descriptions, uh, try to translate them into something practical, something that makes sense to us. I'll put this on the screen for your benefit. The Omar Chizkia. Chizkia said, This is a series of quotes from a man called Chizkia. Omar Rabirmia, that he's quoting Rabirmia as having said, Mishum Rabbi Shimon ben Yechoi, who was in turn quoting Rabbi Shimon ben Yechoi as saying, So who, who's really the progenitor of this teaching? Who's really the source of this teaching is Rabbi Shimon ben Yechoi. Rabbi Shimon ben Yechoi said, Raisi b'nei aliyah. I have seen people who are lofty, vehein mu'atim, and they are few. Benei aliyah. We know the word aliyah because today aliyah means to go up to the Holy Land. Aliyah means to leave the diaspora and go to Israel. Right? That's not what we are talking about here. If that's benei aliyah, then they are not mu'atim. They are very many, and there should be more. However, um, why is it called Aliyah? David HaMelech coined the phrase. Uh, the Mishnah borrows the phrase. Sheyalu li Yerushalayim. That they ascended to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is high. So Aliyah means high. Aliyah also means to be called to the Torah. Why should a person, why is getting called to the Torah a aliyah? There's deep meaning behind it, but simply you go up to the podium. You go from your seat to the podium. That is a, uh, that's a, an upgrade. What else is aliyah? Uh, the attic is called the aliyah. There was... One, there were, uh, let's see, it's a principle in Talmud that Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai, two Talmudic academies in the era of the Talmudic peoples, in the Mishnaic era, whenever they are debating with each other on halachic matter, Beis Hillel, Hillel's academy, wins. Except for, I believe it's six. I'm not sure about the number. Why? Well, there once upon a time was a meeting in somebody's attic, in somebody's aliyah, and there they sorted out 18 halachis, and uh, of them, Beis Shammai won, because there were more representatives from Shammai's camp than Hillel's camp, so Shammai, Beis, Beis Shammai, Shammai's academy, won the debates. But the point of the story that I'm sharing is not so that we should study Talmud and Talmudic debates and the mechanisms of how we decipher halacha when there is a debate, but just to show you that the term aliyah means an attic. What else does aliyah mean? Aliyah simply means ascension, to go up high. So when a person is going up high, then um, 
It's called their oile. They're being oile. Let's look at Rashi. Why is why are we refer? Why are we being taught about bnei aliyah? Why are what does it mean bnei aliyah? Raisi bnei aliyah vehim muatim says Rashi. Roya ani I see lefim ma'isa habriyas according to the behaviors of people she bnei aliyah that elevated people is kat hamekablim pnei shchino. That means a small, that means the group that are worthy of greeting the Shekhinah every day through their behavior, Mu'atim him, they are few. So elevated people, lofty people means people whose behavior makes them worthy to greet the Shekhinah. Says the Maharsha, what does it mean, B'nai Aliyah? It means... In heaven, they are called Aliyah. And Sadikim who are on the earth that are connected with the level that is called Aliyah, they are called, so long as they're on the earth, they are called Bnei Aliyah. It's the same as saying, are you a Ben Olam Haba? Do you deserve to go to Olam Haba? Are you a Ben Aliyah? Do you deserve to reach that level when the neshama will retire into the world of souls, will your neshama retire to a place called Aliyah? To a place called Aliyah. Will your neshama be on the level of Aliyah? If yes, then you are called B'nai Aliyah. And what Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai is saying, that the group of such tzaddikim is very small. He says, Ratzoleimar, agudosei shel tzaddikim hashayochim sham ba'aretz, I'll be honest, I don't understand. I'm not sure what he's saying. So we go back. Why are they called B'nai Aliyah according to Hasidus? According to Hasidus, they are called B'nai Aliyah because aliyah means ascension, aliyah means elevation. And these tzaddikim, who in their avoidas Hashem, not only have they succeeded in subduing the evil of their animal soul to the point where it is silent, but in fact, they were successful even in transforming the evil of their animal soul so that the animal soul should be a force, a cause, for goodness and holiness in their life, desiring only a connection to Hashem, just like their divine soul. That is an elevation. Those are elevated people. They have successfully elevated all the parts of their selves. Says Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, Im Elefim, if there are a thousand, and the Marsha explains that what Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai saw, maybe it was the Bnei Yayada, what did Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai saw? See, what did Rabbi Shimon Yechai see? He saw in past generations that Bnei Aliyah were very few. Such tzaddikim, such tzaddikim, whom Rashi describes as those who are able to perceive godliness with a clear vision instead of with a, a vision that's cloaked in parable and representations. They are very few. <clears throat> Usually that description is, is uh, reserved for prophets, but here, and here, uh, the commentaries are assigning that even, and the Gemara will say that, actually, that's not Nehei Yod or anybody. <laughs> the Gemara will say it. Rabbi Shem Ben Yechai says, if there are a thousand, my son and I are among them. If there are a hundred, my son and I are among them. And if there are only two, B'nai Aliyah in the generation, it's me and my son. Uh, so as the Gemara says, Umi Zutikulahai. Is it such a small number? The Ha'amar Rava didn't Rava say Tamnesri Alfei have a daughter the Kamei that you have at least eighteen thousand righteous people who dwell in a who dwell before Hashem. Shenemra, as it says, Saviv Shmenasar Aleph, that around him there are eighteen thousand. That means there are at least eighteen thousand tzaddikim. So why would you say that there's a thousand or a hundred or two? It should be 18,000. It says the Gemara Loikashen. 
the number 18,000 is referring to one type of tzaddik, and the number 1,000 or 100 or 2 is referring to a different kind of tzaddik. What kind of tzaddikim are we describing as the 1,000, the 100, or the 2? These, the few that Rabbi Shimon is describing, are those who can see through a, through a clear glass partition. Those are the, the 18,000 are tzaddikim who don't see through a clear partition, but they do, they, they do, mekabu uh, pnei they do receive the presence of Hashem, but not in a crystal clear, uh, not with a crystal clear uh, perception. So the Gemara wants to clarify more. And are you suggesting, is it correct to suggest that those who can see Hashem with a clear perception, that they are so very few, a thousand or a hundred or maybe even two. The didn't Abaye say that the world never has fewer than 36 tzaddikim, the Mekabla Pishkina Bakalyem, who accept, who receive the face of the presence of the Shina each and every day. Shanemar, as it says, Ashere Kol Khe Loi. As it says, fortunate are those who wait for him. Why does it say who wait for him? It should have simply said, fortunate are all his awaiters. It's the same thing. And because it's because it's fewer letters, the Torah sh should have, by the rules of Torah being perfect in and not and not using any extra words, not even any extra letters, then by saying Fortunate are those who wait for him. Uh, the word loy is focused on, is zoomed in on by the Chachamim. And they translate loy as the number 36. Who are those? How many are there who await Hashem's presence to greet him each and every day? Is the minimum of 36. Says the Gemara again, loy kasha. No problem. Why? Because we're talking about different kinds of tzaddikim. Ha de ayole bivar, ha de ayole belovar. These are they who approach the Shekhinah with bar, and these are those who approach the Shekhinah without bar. What's bar? Bar could mean several things. Bar, simply understood the way that it's translated in here in the translation, it means with permission. Those who approach, those who have to ask permission before they approach the holiness of Asha, they have to prepare themselves, they have to uh, sanctify their minds and their bodies. That's one kind of tzaddik. But then you have a tzaddik like Moshe Rabbeinu about whom it says, Bechol beisi nemonhu. Hashem says about Moshe Rabbeinu, he's welcome anywhere in my house. He has access to all the keys in my house. No problem. He doesn't have to ask permission to enter my space, to enter into a conversation, into a, a, a special deep connection with Hashem. Now, you also have the term bar, means it's referred to in Kabbalah. You have two words in Kabbalah. You have bar and you have koi. Bar is spelled beis resh and koi is spelled kof hey. The final three letters of the name of Hashem is hey and vav and hey. How much is that? Hey and vav and hey. 21. Um, nope, hey and vav and hey is how much? Sixteen. Hey, something's wrong. <laughs> Thought I had it. The final three letters of the name of Hashem, regardless of how much they, how much they uh, equal to, uh, the final three letters of the name of Hashem. Uh, correspond to three out of the five levels of soul. 
Every soul has five levels. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chayo, and Yechido. We discussed this last week also. Of Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chayo, and Yechido, a person, a human being, has access to three. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama. And that's called Koi. You know the saying, Va'amartem koi lechoi. From the song of Rashbi, when they sing it, Va'amartem koi lechoi, Rabbi Shimin bar yoi What does it mean, koi lechoi? Choi is Rashi Teves, Chayo Yechido. So Va'amartem koi lechoi means that we're, it's a reference to a connection that is being made between the levels of soul represented by koi, which is nefesh, ruach, neshama, and choi, which is chayo and yechida, the higher portions of the soul. And this, the B'nai Yehiyoto says, a person who is lucky enough to approach Hashem with the higher portions of his soul, chayo, yechida, those are very few. That's a neshama from Atzilos. That's a very lofty person. The rest of us have to suffice, even the great tzaddikim among us, mostly have to suffice with interacting with Hashem on the level of nefesh, ruach, neshama, on the level of koi. What is the level, what are the, what the, uh, the two portions of the soul called chayo and yechido? What are they? They are referred to as bar. Bar could, un- be, could be understood as outside of. So nefesh, ruach, neshama is inside the body of the person, could be connected with the body of the person, and bar, chayo, yechida, remain always outside the body of the person, bar. So you have tzaddikim who serve Hashem with bar, like the Gemara said. Bar means the higher levels of the soul. Or you have tzaddikim who serve Hashem with koi, not with bar, with the regular portions of the soul that a human being is privy to. And then finally, the bnei yodo, makes an interesting, beautiful comment. And, um, and that is like this. Let's say, let's say this Pasuk is a description of the 36 holy tzaddikim, and there are 36. What makes this group of tzaddikim extra special? Because bar is also, bar also translates as son, like a father and a son. And what Rabbi Shimon ben Yechoi is saying is that the uniqueness of these two tzaddikim, Rabbi Shimon and his son, is that it's not many great tzaddikim who can come and approach Hashem on an equal level as their own son. Usually, you have a big tzaddik, and the people around him are also tzaddikim, but not on the same level. It's very rare that you have a father and a son that are equally powerful tzaddikim, equally complete tzaddikim. And Rabbi Shem Ben Yechai may have been saying um, that you have a tzaddikim, you have the many tzaddikim who serve Hashem without, on a level, without their own bar, without their own sons. Their sons are they're on a different level than they. But you have the perfect tzaddikim who serve Hashem with bar with their own sons, like Rabbi Shem ben Yechai and his son. Um, an interesting tidbit from this Bnei Yehiyad who brought from the Siddur of the Rashash, was a big Kabbalist, and generally we don't learn Kabbalah, but it's a cute thing, so I'll bring it, I'll, I'll share it with you, that the words, then we say the word Baracha, send Baracha to us. What's Baracha? Baracha is bar koi. Bar is the higher levels of soul, and, and koi is the lower levels of the soul. So are we asking that the light of Hashem should flow through all the levels of our soul? Are we asking that Hashem should provide us access to all the levels of our soul? Are we asking that Hashem should connect the two levels of soul to each other? 
I don't know. I didn't read the Siddur of the Rashash. I just know that Barucha is, is connected with those two things, the levels of soul that we discussed, Bar and Koi. Okay, we've had enough fun. Now let's go back in the time. <laughs> We're talking about the Tzaddik who is not yet complete. And we're continuing where we left off last week. The tzaddik she'ene gomer hu she'ene seyna hasitra achra betachlis hasino. The tzaddik who is incomplete, why is he incomplete? Why hasn't he made it all the way? The answer is because he does not despise, he does not despise evil completely. What does it mean he doesn't despise evil completely? Says the Alter Rebbe, it means that he's not disgusted with it to the highest level. An example. Let's say a person is, uh, you, you're cleaning up your kitchen and you find a bag of bread and the bag is it's growing colors. Happens sometimes. Especially on a humid day, the bags of bread grow colors. What do you do with this bag of bread? You wrap it twice, according to halacha, you have to wrap it twice. You don't throw bread out in the garbage. You wrap it twice, and you throw it in the garbage. Because <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to eat it? It's disgusting. Let's say, let's say, Rahman al for some reason, a person has no access to bread, and all that he has is this colorful bag of bread. What's he going to do? He's going to explain to himself, that penicillin is mold and mold is penicillin and he's going to eat the bread, colors and all. But he'll have no delight in it. He'll have no joy in it. It may turn his stomach a little bit. A tzaddik who is not complete and does not despise evil completely, for him, evil is like the moldy bread. I will not eat it. I don't want to eat it. If I had to eat it, it would make me nauseous. But it's not correct to say that it's so disgusting that I would die before I would eat it. Right? Uh, you don't have to use your imagination very, very, you don't need a strong imagination to think of things that a person would rather die before they were made to eat those things. It's, that's called absolute disgust. Absolute disgust. You cannot, you will not, you would rather die. That's the, that's the difference between the complete tzaddik's feelings towards evil and the incomplete tzaddik's feelings towards evil. Where does this difference come from? The difference comes from the fact the chol she'ein ha'sin of ha'mi es Whenever you have a person whose hatred and disgust is not ultimate, is not absolute, you must, you have no choice but to admit that there is left in his animal soul, not God forbid, to say that a tzaddik has some interest in those things. We're not talking about the tzaddik himself now. We're talking about the animal soul that exists inside of the tzaddik. That in the animal soul that exists inside of the tzaddik, you have some interest remaining about physical pleasures. It's not completely transformed to holiness, where the animal soul also would be so nauseous, eating the uh, involving itself in, phys in physical worldly pleasures, where the animal soul would be upset and disgusted by anything that pulls him away from Hashem. That's a full tzaddik. Here you have a, the regular tzaddik, the, the tzaddik that is not yet complete means that his animal soul still, still identifies with the world and its pleasures. Mm -hmm. That means that the dirty, filthy garments of the animal soul, that means its capacity to desire worldly things has not been removed from it. True, there is no expression of this. The animal soul doesn't express any interests for worldly things, but its capacity to express those worldly things, those worldly interests has not been removed, has not been overwhelmed by its, by its uh, gushing love for Hashem. 
Velochen, and therefore, Loi Nepach Letev Mamish. We cannot claim that this tzaddik's animal soul has to has been transformed to holiness, really, to goodness. Because it still is holding on to those filthy garments. And like it says in the holy books, you cannot maintain your attention on two things simultaneously. True, hold on. The truth is that the human being can. Because the human being is made of two souls. On the one hand, the godly soul yearns for godliness, and on the other hand, the animal soul yearns for animalistic things. And therefore, it's possible that the human being can be interested in both things. Both things cannot, op- both things cannot occupy his attention at the same time. But to have interest in the- both of those things, a-, a human being is capable. That's the whole point of what the al is telling us. We are a dichotomy. We are a contradiction. But the animal soul itself, cannot be interested in two things. The Alta Rebbe said, if you were only one soul and you were interested in two things, then you'd have a problem. Then you need to see a psychiatrist because that is a split personality and it's no good. But because we have two separate souls, each one can want what it wants and it's not a contradiction. Here we're talking about one soul. We're talking about the animal soul in the tzaddik that is not yet complete. This animal soul still has interest in Donuts, it cannot be 100% devoted to Hashem. By definition, it cannot be 100% devoted to Hashem. And that means that it has not truly been transformed. Ella, then in what state is this animal soul by the tzaddik? Why does he get to be called the tzaddik if he still has the capacity to desire foreign things, unholy things? The state of the animal soul or let's be very specific. Let's go all the way down to the, uh, to the atomic level. The state of the unholiness, the state of the evil in the animal soul is shehu bottle bimi'utai. Because it is so minimal, it is overwhelmed. It is a bottle because of its smallness. And the definition of bottle, like we learned a while back in the laws of Kashros, batil means although it does exist, it is as though it doesn't. Because it is so overwhelmed by the opposite thing that exists in such great volume, in such great numbers, that it leaves the, uh, it leaves the foreign thing completely insignificant, completely irrelevant, as though it exists is of no matter. So in the, in the animal soul of the tzaddik, in the animal soul of the tzaddik, what's going on? What does the neighborhood look like in the animal soul of the incomplete tzaddik? Well, it looks like this. It was Tuesday morning, and the tzaddik was davening, and he was meditating on the greatness of Hashem, how Hashem is beyond the world and how Hashem fills the world and how Hashem's existence is the cause of all existence and how the very existence of the body of this tzaddik is the product of Hashem's existence and therefore the world and the body of the tzaddik is all nullified and therefore true value can be found only in holiness and therefore the tzaddik's heart flares up with yearning to be connected to Hashem and this love fills the whole space of his heart on the right side of his heart where the godly soul's influence can usually spread. And then the love is so overwhelming that the walls, yeah, the emotional walls of his heart burst and the love for Hashem spills over into the left side of his heart. Yeah, and the, and the animal soul's neighborhood gets completely redecorated. And instead of, instead of consciously yearning for donuts and for, uh, and for a walk on the beach and for, uh, and for a first-class ticket on, a, you know, on the fancy airlines where you have a bed and a shower, <laughs> it's an, these are the pleasures of the world. Instead, the animal soul, the animal soul is delighting in its connection with Hashem. The animal soul is desiring a greater connection with Hashem. The animal soul is loving 
this unique bond, this special experience that it is now sharing with its counterpart, the divine soul, inside the life of this incomplete tzaddik. And yet, and yet, in the management offices of the animal soul incorporated, there still is a file in the top drawer that says worldly interests. And the file is still there. And all the previous delights and all the previous joys of the animal soul, including but not limited to the food that it ate, the trips that it took, the sights that it saw, the things that it experienced that, make, that made it feel so good and comfortable and safe, they're all listed there in the special file called Worldly Interests. And that file is still there. And the management of the animal soul has no, has no uh, intention of shredding that file and burning it up in the fiery love for Hashem. And that means, that means that until the, until all the way till top management of the animal soul is transformed and that file is burned, a tzaddik cannot be called complete. Because you cannot, you cannot leave space. You cannot leave space for worldly interests if you are entirely transformed into a servant of Hashem. If the animal soul were transformed into an absolute force for goodness, there would not even be a possibility for worldly interests. Moldy bread would start to look like those things that one would rather die than eat. And yet he's a tzaddik. What do we do? How do we describe this dichotomy where the man is a tzaddik or the lady is a tzaddik and the love for Hashem has burst the emotional walls of the heart and influenced the animal soul to the point where the animal soul desires, enjoys a connection with Hashem. What do we call? But still there is, a, still there is one file left in management's office of interests in worldly things. What do we call this tzaddik? This tzaddik we call, he's called tzaddik vera loy. He's called a righteous man with evil to him. And the Alter Rebbe adds uh, an interpolation. Interpolation means you add into the words a bit of more words, a few more words to help you understand exactly what's happening. So the Alter Rebbe says, Tzadik vera loy, which is the Gemara's term, that's, that's Talmudic language, the Alter Rebbe adds, Tzadik with evil to him, read it, Tzadik with evil completely nullified and humbled to him. There is evil there, but it's absolutely nullified and absolutely humbled, silenced in the life of the tzaddik. The evil of the animal soul is absolutely silent in the life of the tzaddik, though it is there. The al and therefore, we're just, we're just tying together all the loose ends. This tzaddik, Obviously, his love for Hashem is obviously also not absolute. The reason that the tzaddik hates the evil of the animal soul and is disgusted by its interests is because of its overwhelming love for Hashem. If the person does not have this absolute overwhelming disgust, absolute disgust 
for the interests of the animal soul and an absolute hatred for the animal soul, then he obviously does not have an absolute love for Hashem. Because they are perfectly commensurate to each other. They are they're perfectly going to be corresponding to each other. I apologize for this analogy, but here we are talking about sending the evil of the animal soul away. And we're talking about hatred and we're talking about disgust. At the beginning of this section, the Alter Rebbe, what we were learning today, the Alter Rebbe says, the hatred and the disgust are not absolute. The tzaddik who's incomplete means that he doesn't hate the side of evil completely, and therefore he is not disgusted by it to the ultimate level. Hatred and disgust. It seems like disgust comes from hatred. Disgust is the product of hatred. It's true. But, but hatred and disgust are also two levels. Two levels. And halacha, halacha indicates that from hatred, you can come back. From disgust, there's no coming back. Where does halacha have this discussion? In the context of a divorce. Yeah. If a lady says about a guy, he disgusts me. Or if a guy says about a lady, she disgusts me. There's no coming back from that. But if the two, when halacha is encouraging people to try to make the marriage work, halacha says if there's hatred, we can still have a conversation. If there's disgust, we cannot even have a conversation. See? The tzaddik who is not complete hates, but he's not disgusted. That means, theoretically, in some foreign world, in some unimaginable circumstances, a tzaddik who is not complete, you, there, it, the forces of evil could have with him a conversation. Come, let's talk, let's negotiate. Maybe we could uh, work out a deal. But the complete tzaddik, his, his response to evil is disgust. And there's no coming back from that. Like the stories that we described. Yeah. In Hasidus, by the way, in Hasidus, we find several levels, several layers, several iterations, versions of hatred. Things that we should hate. For example, generally in hatred, there's a hatred that you feel from afar. And there's hatred that you feel personally. You hate something that has some kind of a, a distant effect on you, but not an immediate effect on you. And then there's a special hatred that you have for things that actually affect you directly. Uh, an example of this, Rabbi Chaikin told the story in Shul this Shabbos, is that the Chassid Rabbi Yamin Kletzke would lay in the Torah, he was the Balkaire, and he was reading, he was not the Balkaire, he was listening to the Balkaire read the Parshas Zohar, which is the commandment in the Torah to eradicate the memory of Amalek. And you, if you watch this chassid, Rabbi Yamin Kletzka Yitzah, you would see that his face literally turned colors. He turned red, and it was so full of hatred, hatred against Amalek, that there was a fellow Jew in there, not, not a chassid, and his name was Reb Zalman. They called him Reb Zalman Zezmer was shocked to see the change that had come over Rabbi Yom Kletzker, and he went over to him and he said, tell me, every Jew reads the parsha of eradicating the memory of Amalek. What exactly did Amalek do to you worse than every other Jew? How come you hate them so much? And Rabbi Yom says to Rabbi Zalman, I can't answer that question. Go to the Alter Rebbe. And so Rabbi Zalman went to the Alter Rebbe and became a big chassid. And uh, we have music from him, Nigunim, that he composed, very profound but to transform, to transform the idea of Amalek 
of evil that is somewhat distant from you and doesn't have a direct, a direct impact on your life. And therefore, you, and therefore you don't like it. You are opposed to the notion of evil. But, um, but you, don't, you don't hate it. On the other hand, there is a hatred for something that attacks you on a regular basis. Something that attacks you on a regular basis, you hate it to the point of death. In yesterday's Rambam, we had another beautiful example of this. We're learning the laws of the Para Aduma, the preparations that are required for the ashes of the red heifer to be sprinkled on a person who became impure with a, through contact with a corpse. The rule, the, the rule of thumb, the principle is that if during the preparations, the person doing the preparations is distracted by some other work, is doing two things at the same time. That mixture that he was working on is disqualified. You have to draw water. You have to bring it to the right place. You have to sprinkle the ashes of the para aduma in it. And then you have to sprinkle that on the person. At any point, if you're distracted, you could disqualify the mixture. So the Rambam goes through a bunch of scenarios about when it's possible to be doing something and it's not considered a distraction. He says, let's say a person killed a snake or a scorpion. Yeah. He was carrying the water, transporting it to the right place. And on the way, he killed a snake or a scorpion. Has he disqualified the, has he disqualified the mixture or not? The answer is clear. If the snake and the scorpion posed an immediate threat to you, you have no choice. You have to kill it. You have to hate it all the way until death. If the snake or the scorpion did not present an immediate danger to you, an immediate risk to you, you should have kept walking and left the snake and the scorpion alone. That's the difference between how, do, how we, the tzaddik, complete tzaddik perceives uh, unholiness and the incomplete tzaddik perceives unholiness. The incomplete tzaddik perceives unholiness as something hateful. And to one degree or another, like we're going to learn soon in the Tanya, to one degree or another, he, he feels its impact on himself and he hates it commensurate to how he feels the impact. But the complete tzaddik, the total tzaddik, the forces of evil are a constant they're a constant uh, enemy. They're always an enemy and always of the highest caliber, always code red, the forces of evil from the perspective of the complete tzaddik. At no point are the forces of evil some theoretical enemy that lives far away, that you don't like them, but you're not filled with rage and hatred against them. That's not how the complete tzaddik lives. The complete tzaddik consistently rages against the forces of evil. Why? Because the complete tzaddik constantly is on fire with love for Hashem and cannot tolerate any interference. Yeah. These things, by the way, according to the principle that the Rebbe taught us, that every teaching in Tanya is relevant to every Jew in every time and in every place and in every station, the fact that we're learning about the tzaddikim contains tremendous lessons for us how we should serve Hashem. So it's true that we're not capable of such an intense and tremendous hatred for evil the way that the perfect tzaddik is, consistent and ongoing without interruption. But having this picture in our minds helps us, should help us, it could help us to generate some measure of upset and anger against the Yetzirah when you're trying to do something and the Yetzirah is in your way.
we realized, how is it that the Yitzhahara could get in our way? It's because when he's not in our way, we relax. Say, you know what? He's not bothering me now. I can let my guard down. Instead of raging against the Yitzhahara all throughout the day, yeah, we, uh, we take our, <laughs> we let the guard go, go home for the night. We dismiss the security forces. And then the Yitzhahara has access again. So what should we do? We should try to be more like the tzaddik. Know what is holy, know what is evil, and constantly love and embrace that which is holy, and constantly rant and rave internally, of course. We don't want to be walking around ranting and raving. Internally, of course, ranting and raving, raging against the forces of evil. And we're talking about in, in a, in, on the truest level. We're not talking about naming names of human beings. We're not talking about naming names of one country or another country. We're not talking about naming names of politicians far away in Washington. We're talking about the goodness, the holiness that is accessible, available in my life, in my day-to-day -day actions, choices, calculations versus the evil ones, the self-serving ones. It's very easy to escape true avoido by trying to address global issues. Because then you, you, can, you can be ranting and raving and raging against injustice forever because you'll never run out of them. You also won't get anywhere in your personal connection with Hashem because the personal connection with Hashem is, ba is based on your choices, your behaviors, your thoughts, your words, not, uh, not universal issues. Let's complete a few more lines of the Tanya. And this way we will finish the discussion about the tzaddik who is incomplete and the tzaddik who is complete. Because his love for Hashem is not absolute, and we know this because his hatred for, for evil should be exactly commensurate to his love for Hashem. Since his hatred for evil is incomplete, we know for a fact that his love for Hashem is not complete, and therefore he is called a tzaddik who is not complete. His righteousness, meaning his bond with Hashem, is incomplete. This level, this tzaddik, this type of tzaddik is obviously, uh, is, there's many gradations. Depending on just how small the presence of evil is in his animal soul. And just how powerful the love for Hashem that spilled over is. Then, uh, and how the two forces, the love for Hashem and the and the potential for interests and worldly affairs, how, how they measure up against each other, each one is its own level. Sometimes the evil is overwhelmed by, by uh, 51% against 49%, like we discussed. Sometimes the, the evil in the animal soul is overwhelmed by, uh, by 60 times its volume or by 100 times its volume, 200 times its volume, 1,000 times its volume. And each tzaddik has their own recipe. Each tzaddik has their own mixture. And each tzaddik is in their own level. That's what we just said. Sometimes it's nullified by 60. Sometimes it's nullified by 1,000 or by 10,000 by way of analogy. These are the many, many tzaddikim that exist in every generation. Like we learned in the Gemara, that 18,000 tzaddikim exist in front of Hashem. But when it comes to the level of the complete tzaddik, that is what Rabbi Shimon Yochai was referring to when he says, I've seen the elevated people, people who have transformed their animal souls into holy souls. They are very few. That's why they are called B'nai Aliyah, elevated people. Because they have transformed evil and elevated it to holiness. How do we know that that is what Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai himself meant when he said B'nai Aliyah? Says the Alter Rebbe, 
because the Rashbi in the Zohar says. About Rashbi, it says. In the Zohar, it says. Rashbi couldn't have written it. Um, but in the, in the introduction to the Zohar, it says that when Rabbi Chia wanted to go into the Gan Eden chamber of Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai, Shama Kolo Nafik Viomar, he heard a voice coming out from that chamber and saying, Man Minchain, the Hashecham Hapchan and Nahira, who among you is it who transformed darkness to light, the Toamin Miridu Lemisko, and transformed bitter flavors into sweetness? Ad La Yesun Hacha, if you haven't done that, you cannot come here. What does that tell us? That tells us that the B'nai Aliyah, the tzaddik who is complete, the perfect tzaddik, is one who has transformed all the evil of his animal soul, all the evil of his nefesh abahamis and of his body to holiness, to goodness. How do we know that? How is this evidence of that? Well, um, do you and I, yes, do we have a chamber in the world to come? Do we have a room in the world of souls waiting for us? By now we do. <laughs> yeah. What does it look like? Well, it looks like us. It looks like our mitzvahs. It looks like our spiritual level. When we were born, um, um, what did our chamber in, in Gan Eden look like? It looked like us. It was a perfect reflection of our divine souls at the time of our birth. Now that we have lived a little, so some human beings have decreased the beauty and splendor of their chamber in the world to come, and some human beings have increased the beauty and splendor of their chamber in the world to come. This is all figurative. This is all by way of illustration. There is not a room anywhere uh, along uh, the whole chain of existence that has your name on it. There's no such room. We're talking about the experience, how each of us will experience the world to come. How will we experience the world to come? It's exactly commensurate to how we lived in this physical world. The more mitzvahs we do, the more beautiful will our experience of the world to come be. The fewer, the more Avedis we did, the more Avedis we did, then the fewer, then, then the, the weaker our experience there is going to be. Rabbi Shimon Be Yechoi had a certain experience of Gan Eden, and Rabbi Chia wanted to join him in his experience. And the voice called out and said, Have you accomplished, have you accomplished spiritually what Rabbi Shimon Ben Yechoi has accomplished spiritually? If you have not, then you cannot. You cannot experience it the same way as him. What did he accomplish in his life? In his life, he accomplished that he transformed darkness to light. In his life, he, ex he accomplished that he transformed bitterness into sweetness. And if you have not done that, that means if your animal soul still has any hint of, of, of unholiness left to it, you're not on the level of Rabbi Shem Ben Yechoi. That's the difference between the B'nai, a B'nai Aliyah and all the tzaddikim will stand before Hashem. Bless you. When we come back next week, Emetz Hashem, we will learn another beautiful advantage of the tzaddik who is complete, and another lesson that we could take from this discussion about tzaddikim and apply to our own lives, and Emetz Hashem, we'll all be in good health by the time that happens. When we, in the meantime, in the meantime, have yourselves a wonderful, beautiful Purim, and um, we'll see you on the other side. Thanks for joining.